Hi, everybody, um, and welcome to IOSH Manchester and Northwest District's presentation for this month. Um, now, now, here's a little story that um, I need to talk to you about. I, not long ago, I read a book called Failure to Learn, which is about the BP Texas oil refinery. It was a really, really riveting read, really enjoyed the learning outcomes from it. And then when I heard that Jill had brought out her book, um, it was the first thing I thought, oh, well, I better get this and have a read through that as well. Now, on the reading of that, it was so, so interesting. Um, some great learning outcomes from it, some great history behind the whole of the actual disaster itself. And I was so lucky that when I got in touch with Jill, uh, she, uh, when I reached out to Jill, she came back and said, yes, she'd be happy to speak for us at Irish Manchester. And I counted that as a, as a great success because, you know, since then, there's been so much going on um, around this story uh, that I think everybody will be waiting to hear what Jill's got to say today. And what, what's happening, I think there's a programme on tomorrow night as well. So uh, I think we're all interested in that. So I shall carry on and hand you over to Jill. And I, from what I've seen, there's a great presentation coming your way. There you go, Jill. Great, thanks. Um, so firstly, I'd just like to say welcome and thanks for taking an hour out of your precious days that are full of lots of things to do to be here in this conversation. Um, just, uh, I will tell you a little bit more about myself. So I'm what's called a master consultant, which I think is very sexist, but I'm still called a master consultant, which fundamentally means I get to do, in, in my view, the most interesting work. So I work for a company called JMJ Associates. We work um, largely in high hazard industries in the domain of leadership and culture. Uh, and I have a particular passion for the prevention of catastrophic events or major accidents. So I go in when there's not a standard solution and work with organizations to come up with solutions. Um, and I have a, another big interest in creating sustainable capability within companies. So that's a little bit about what I do. As I said, my focus is culture and leadership, and I have a passion for major accident prevention. Um, I also was a Grenfell Tower resident from 2011 to 2014. On the right, you will see a picture of my apartment. It was flat 185 on the 21st floor. Um, my husband and I just moved back to London and um, we're looking for somewhere to rent. If anybody knows this area of London, it's super, super expensive. And everything I was looking at, I hated. And then this high rise apartment caught my eye. And we walked in and fell in love with it. And it remains to this day one of the most beautiful places I've lived. The um, two memories are of the views and of the sound of children playing. So on our floor, there were three families with children of similar ages. And they used to play around in the lift lobby. We used to keep the door open. They used to run in and out, squeal when they saw us and run out again. So that, that is my memory of living in Grenfell. And then in 2014, we'd by that stage fallen in love with high rise living and bought an apartment in a nearby tower block called Trelic Tower, which is a grade two listed modernist, um, brutalist architectural building. And our views were of Grenfell. That picture is a picture from Trelic onto Grenfell before the fire, which always used to fill me with joy and happy memories. And then um, I'm now also an author, as Stuart has said, um, in May published a book called Catastrophe and Systemic Change. Um, the, the, the Duncan Spencer, who some of you may know, I spoke to him last week, he did a wonderful review of it recently as well, which I was very appreciative of. Um, I just like people to think back to the first moment you saw pictures of the fire because I know those moments can change us and for me it was walking into my bedroom at around 1 20 in the morning so around half an hour after the fire had started and seeing that picture um, and it's something as with any 
catastrophic event that is seared into my memory, but also because of my background. The other picture that was there for me was Piper Alpha, which again, most people on this call will know about. I didn't at the time know about the number of similarities. For example, Piper, the refurbishment on Piper made it more dangerous, the removal, for example, of the glass walls. And also in Piper, the people that survived were people that defied the policy and jumped into the sea, which was most meant to lead to certain death. So there were um, many similarities, but right from the moment I first saw the fire, there's obviously both a personal interest, uh, interest the wrong word, but a personal devastation is probably more the right word, but there's always been a professional interest as well. Um, so why am I, what, you know, why did I say yes? Why did I write the book? Why am I talking to you today? So I've done a lot of speaking in the last couple of months. And in some ways, I've found it not that satisfying um, because it's a little bit like sometimes I feel like people are coming to hear me talk about something. And I wrote the book and I'm here today because I want change and I can't do that on my own. So my invitation is when you're listening to this is listen through a lens of what are you going to do differently after this conversation? So, you know, often we're in these kinds of things and we, we listen a little bit as an observer, like what might be interesting or what might catch my eye. Um, but I'm not talking from that perspective. I didn't say yes from that perspective. I want things to change. And I want more people to be engaged in change. So my invitation is to listen a little bit more edgily uh, and be willing to look at where you might, for example, not be speaking up and um, or where you might not be listening as examples. So that's why I'm talking today and why I said yes. And this is just what I'm going to cover. I'm going to go very quickly through some of the what happens. So I always assume everybody knows what happened, but that's not the case. I'm intimately involved in it and uh, obviously follow it really closely. So I'll just go through um, a little bit of the, 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 the elements that contributed to being catastrophic and then look at the failures to learn and then go a little bit into what I cover in the book in terms of change and myths and disruption and want to leave significant time at the end for Q&A. And I, as was said at the beginning, feel free to put questions in chat now as we go through or at the end. So the, the thing that's often spoken about is the cladding system. So but my view is it's overly focused on a, both in the remediation and the response, but also when we talk about grainfall. But the cladding was the main source of fire. So we know that, uh, that cladding was the main source of the spread of fire. Um, I'm not going to talk through every single item on this slide. I, I'm kind of assuming a lot of people on this call are technical and you'll skim this and it'll make sense to you. But fundamentally, we have a polyethylene core, which is highly flammable and also drips when it burns. So a lot of the, the heat source was because of the PE dripping and starting fires further down the building or getting um, in the cassettes and spreading in the cassettes. And then we also have insulation that supported an enabled fire spread and missing or wrongly installed cavity barriers. So the cladding system obviously is, is a big part of it. But also there was the, the windows. So in the refurbishment, the windows were moved outwards to sit flush with the cladding and new frames and extractor fans were made up of UPVC, which many people will know, loses stiffness and melts at low temperatures. Um, and there were no cavity barriers. This was the, the, the regulations were that there should be cavity barriers around the windows, but there were none present either in the design or in the building itself. And if you look at the picture, you can just see that it's just surrounded by flammable materials. And then another distinguishing feature at Grenfell is the architectural crown, which is thought to be why the whole building was engulfed. So again, it was made up of this ACM cassettes, which were folded. 
And with the ACM cassettes, when you fold them, you're exposing the polyethylene core. So the, the thinking is, is that the crown is what caused the building to become engulfed because once it reached the crown, it could spread around because of all of the exposed polyethylene and then drip down and start fires throughout the building. And the changes to the architectural crown um, were purely aesthetic. So the results. So there was a small kitchen fire. So it's the size of a waste paper basket the kind of fire that you would expect any building to be resilient to. Um, and it's thought to have started in a fridge freezer with plastic backing. Interestingly, in the US, um, fridge freezers need to have metal backing, but in Europe and the UK, they can have plastic backing, which obviously um, doesn't inhibit the spread of flames as a metal backing would. And the breaking of compartmentation, um, is thought to have happened at around 1.14. That's before the firefighters even entered the kitchen. And it likely went through the UPVC window frames or extractor fan. And as soon as that happened, it would have ignited any of the components. And once breached, um, fire spread was inevitable. So the breaking of comp compartmentation happened really early on. The stay put strategy, so the entire firefighting strategy relied on stay put working, which relied on compartmentation working. And it became untenable at 1.14 when compartmentation was breached and it was reversed much later, only at 2.47. Um, the external fire spread, so within 15 minutes, the fire spread up the buildings and the material fed off one another, multiple routes. One thing that people often don't know is there's two ways of, um, of putting the ACM cladding onto the building. One was through riveting it directly. The other one was through putting it on metal rails or hanging it. Um, they chose hanging for aesthetic reasons. It was more expensive, but it was also uh, worse in fire because you bent the ACM panels, which again exposed the polyethylene core. In addition, as with all major catastrophes, there were a number of other control failures, um, some of which were fire doors, door closes not working, the stairwell doors were propped open, problems with ventilation, um, a missing fire lift, um, inability to override the fire lift by the firefighters, which meant they couldn't use the lift and couldn't stop residents using the lift. It had a dry riser instead of a wet riser. And another um, interesting fact that is not well known is floor numbers were unclear. So as I said, I lived in apartment 185. When I lived there, that was on the 18th floor. So, um, and then when they did the refurbishment, they added three floors of residential flats down the bottom of the, flat, uh, of the building and changed the floor numbers. So rather than being on floor 18, it became on floor 21. Um, and if you just think about those changes in terms of orientation, the signage hadn't been changed. So um, it was difficult again for residents and for um, firefighters to know where they were in the building. That's, uh, I find that really interesting probably because it took me about three months to figure out why they kept saying the, the um, building was 22 floors, stories high. Um, and the results. So. I'll, I'll be quiet for a minute and just let people read the stats. The pictures on the right are of some of my neighbours, so the Al Wahhabi family, Abdulaziz, Nahuda, Fauzia, Mehdi, and Yassin. And the picture um, on its side is is a, a friend of Yassin made that after the fire. Uh, and it became I used to go and leave flowers there a lot in the in the months after the fire. One of the things that happened with everything in the building is at some point, uh, you know, the, the conditions were changing rapidly. And at some point, there became a 
a hot zone around the middle of the building and people that were trying to get down went back up again and many of those people die and the Al Wahhabi family were one of those that were trying to go down the building and apparently somebody said go back because of the hot zone well it's thought because of the hot zone and they went back up again and they died in their in their flat um and then on on the the right is the Gomez family so um Andrea and Marcio and a picture of Logan Isaac, which they have published. They, they, I wouldn't share it if it wasn't public, but one of the findings from the Hillsborough disasters was doing pen portraits of victims at the beginning of inquiries. And the first time that that was done was at the Grenfell Inquiry. Um, and these pictures here are of Marcio and Andrea sharing about Logan Isaac during the pen portraits. I would highly recommend anybody listen to also listen to Marcio's evidence during the inquiry the fire it was on the phone with the fire brigade control room as the fire broke into their apartment so there is a recording of him escaping the building and he is keen for people to hear that to understand how terrifying that was for him and there's a a moment I went when he gave evidence I went to the inquiry it was pre-COVID so we could go to the inquiry and it is one of the most harrowing things I've ever listened to is a father talking about getting his beloved wife and children and his neighbors out of the tower and at one point thinking he'd lost them all so I would really recommend that it's on the BBC um podcast series have a special episode dedicated to that. I can send the links out after the call. So one of the things with working in major accidents is I know that they can be a real catalyst to change. Um, so in the initial in the, in the initial aftermath of Grainfall is I was actually quite hopeful. But then I started to uncover all of the failures to learn. So um, firstly, this, the risk of fire spread through external cladding was well known. Uh, this is from June 1999. I remember the moment I read this report. So it's fire brigade evidence into a select committee hearing. So 1999. And I remember sitting and reading that evidence and just bursting into tears. So we knew that there was a danger of external cladding. And then if you look, there's many, many, many other examples pre the fire up to and including 2016. After that fire, there was warnings for all local councils to check the cladding that was on their building. And the fire brigade, the London fire brigade had a tall building facades um, presentation from July 2016. So remember, the fire happened less than a year later. And it's thought that only one person most um, at the fire ground had seen that presentation. So the risks were known. And then obviously also um, there's now the now famous blog by Eddie and Francis warning of, I'll just let people read that, it speaks for itself, but the failure to listen to residents' concerns as well. Then there were also failings of the response. So I am a really fierce defender of the firefighters on the ground that night, but there were key failings and to honor the people that died, I think we need to learn from them. And sometimes we feel like we can't be straight because there's this hero narrative that almost stops us from looking at these failings. But there were failings in planning and preparation by policy. They should have had a, um, a backup plan to evacuate the building if needed. Um, and also the plans were really old, so they didn't have updated plans of the building. At the incident ground, critically, stay put was an article of faith. There was a failure in command. So the poor, poor first commander, I, I don't like mentioning names of the, of the firefighter, but the first commander um, was... I think he should have been in control of a fire up to eight units. And by the time somebody took over from him, it was more than 20. So he was completely out of his depth and he wasn't given the support that was needed. 
So there was enormous failures of command until Andy Rowe took over and changed the state part, state put policy immediately. And then um, physical and electronic systems failed as well. And in the control room, fire, fire survival, survival guidance call, they're called FSG calls and advice. So one of the findings from Lacanel was to not give false hope to people. So not to say firefighters are coming when in fact you didn't know whether they were coming and that lesson wasn't learned. So in Grenfell, people were told that the firefighters were coming when that wasn't the case. And there is an, a number of people gave evidence that if they'd been told the truth, they would have acted differently and tried to get out differently. Um, and then communication with the incident ground, there were a number of um, breakdowns there. One of the issues was that they were in a, they weren't in their normal um, co command unit, sorry, control unit. They were in a temporary unit, a temporary unit because they were doing some renovations and they didn't have a TV, so they couldn't actually see the fire. So they couldn't see how much it was spreading. Um, and, and if you just think about, they were operating as if it was a normal fire. So they had people calling soon after the first call saying I'm on the 18th, 19th floor and the fire's outside my window and the, and the control room operators would say, no, 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 it's not, it's on the fourth floor. So you just see people operating from what they thought was happening, not what was actually happening. So what I thought would happen was, uh, you know, 72 deaths in the richest borough in London um, biggest fire since the Second World War. I thought there would be a unified cross-party response. I thought that the survivors and bereaved would be taken care of, that buildings would be made safe, and that there'd be bold leadership for change from both government and industry. And we haven't seen that. So four years after Grenfell, again, I'm not going to read through these figures myself. I'll leave them on the screen. Four years after Grenfell, this is the situation. We're only beginning to understand the mass failure of building safety over the last decades. And then the devastating consequences for people caught up in the building safety scandal. For those of you that don't know much about that, there was a Newsnight program dedicated to that last week. And then what we're learning from the Grenfell Tower Inquiry, which starts again today, in fact, with evidence from Barbara Lane, is the three things that are there for me is the merry-go-round of buck passing. So we have a supply chain, everybody blaming everybody else and nobody accepting responsibility. We have a great corporate scandal with um, product manufacturers knowing of the fire safety risks, but going ahead and using them here anyway because of weak regulatory systems and the gaming of testing systems and product classification. And then we see the narratives that are used to silence. So in the case of Grenfell, the famous ones are about the rebel residents, aggressive, vocal, and that was that languaging was used both by the RBKC, by the tenant management organization that managed the building at the time, and by um, the supply chain. So the narratives that silence realisms, including banning the blog that Eddie had written. So people within the, I think that was the TMO, the RBKC, I can't quite remember, but they, they wouldn't have been able to read that because the residents were troublesome. So um, it's been kind of like two and a half years, not really uh, trying to do what I knew would make a difference and was largely met with closed doors. And the question that I was asking, which was what are the lessons to learn from Grenfell had to change to why does our failure to learn make sense? Because what happened at Grenfell happens everywhere. So we just see these same patterns repeated again and again and again. Something catastrophic happens. We spend enormous amounts of money, um, emotional investment from people that are impacted to identify lessons and we fail to learn them. So through uh, a, a 
very good friend of mine introduced me to someone who is the editor of my book. She said to me, would you like to write a book? Diane Coyle's her name. And the book really attempts to answer this question is why does our failure to learn make sense? Um, and it's split into two parts. I, I'm not going to try and recreate the book in a 30 minute <laughs> talk. I'm going to cover a little bit of it, but this is just what the book covers. The first part is what happened. So um, not just the cladding and then before, during and after. So, so looking at the failures to learn what happened in terms of the response and then what's happened afterwards in terms of what we know about the inquiry and also the government response to the broader building safety issues. And then part two, analysis and reflections, really looks at why does our failure to learn make sense. It looks at the three lenses that I look through, which are complexity, safety and systemic change. And then I'll talk through these elements, which are um, what I call the Grenfell model for systemic change. And I have been very blown away by the response to it because mostly I wrote it for myself. I was like a little bit like I need to answer this question to myself. And I was very fortunate to have been offered the opportunity to write it. So I have been amazed at the response and I'm very grateful for it. But the one that um, I think touched me the most is by the coroner of Lacknell House, Frances Kirkham, who, who did read a, you know, and endorsed the book. She, she read a, um, pre-publication copy and endorsed the book, which meant an enormous amount to me. Uh, I'm very lucky also to have met her a couple of times. She's an incredible woman. So I'm going to cover a couple of the key concepts. One of the biggest ones, I think, why we fail to learn is we take an approach called piece, a piecemeal approach to change, not a systemic approach to change. I'm not saying that piecemeal is not important. I think it is important, but we need to also look at things systemically. Um, and the intent of piecemeal change is you're looking at solving a piecemeal issue like changing the cladding or um, having you know fire doors that are compliant or, or, or stop fire for 30 minutes, et cetera, et cetera. So what you're asking is what's wrong with the system. You're assuming a controlled, predictable world. You typically have technical solutions. So if I do X, then Y will happen. And the leadership style can be bureaucratic command control rules based and relies on traditional notions of expertise, where systemic change is, is far more complex. So um, we're talking about holding, you're talking about looking at the shifting the conditions that are holding the status quo in place. You need to look at what is the system perfectly designed for versus what's wrong or with it, hence the title, you know, making the water visible. The assumption is that the world is complex and emergent. Your access to change is really grappling with the messiness of um, what you see of the, the, the system. And your approach to change is about disruption. So experimenting, so doing X and seeing what happens versus relying on this predictable world. And your leadership style needs to be much more organic, emergent, values and principle-based, inquiry, and all stakeholders' expertise is required and validated and used. Um, so that, I think, is, is, is one of the key things. And when I talk about disruption, we often have this negative notion of disruption. Like we think that's a negative trait. I think disruption is positive and critical. And um, I, I always talk to the positive, the, the disruptive power of kindness. And this quote is by Eddie Defan, um, when he was giving evidence at the inquiry, he was asked at the end by um, Sir Martin Warbeck if there was anything else he wants to say. And he said, they didn't treat us with respect or empathy or humanity. And if they had, I wouldn't be sitting here now. So I often um, think about the disruptive power of respect, empathy, and humanity, and what would shift if we simply took on treating one another in that way. And then the other, the, the analysis really ends up with the Grenfell model for systemic change, which looks at governing and operating frameworks and then obvious and obscure elements. Foundational looking at what's in place to prevent catastrophic outcomes, which is a lot around regulations, guidance, you know, governance, accountabilities, behaviors, the mechanisms in place to prevent and respond. So 
regulated scrutiny mecha mechanisms and quest inquiries. Those are the obvious elements and that's where we tend to focus. But if we actually look at it, there's much more, the obscure elements are much trickier, but we also can't create systemic change without tackling them. So the relational issues, interactions between stakeholders, things like regulatory capture, the revolving door between industry and government, civil service, speaking truth to power, those types of issues and contextual issues. So culture, trust, bias, unquestioned assumptions um, and beliefs. So those are the elements that I believe we need to look at when we're considering systemic change. And in the book, I, I look at trying to answer why don't we learn and then how might we enable systemic change through those four lenses and consider myths, known issues, lessons, specific lessons from Grenfell, what are the conditions holding the status quo in place and what are opportunities to disrupt. And I look at case studies, so in foundational, I look at the Great Fire of London um, in behavioral, I, I look at the um, Boeing 737 MAX disasters in relational, the Costa Concordia, and then in contextual, the Hillsborough disasters, just as frames to explore these concepts. And I'm going to touch on two of them. Uh, sorry, this is the messy kaleidoscope. So this is kind of like a summary of the main issues that come out of that analysis. And if you just read down them, you could say this is pretty much for most catastrophic events, not just for Grenfell, but these are the kinds of things that contribute to catastrophic failures. And our response doesn't tend to deal with them or even attempt to deal with many of them. I'm going to touch on the myths that I believe hold the status quo in place, um, which for many of you will make sense, I think, just given this audience. So the first one is that regulations guarantee safe outcomes. So I think we still have this myth that if we just change the regulations, everything will be fine. Whereas, as we know, regulations are reactive, um, they additive, um, they can be inaccessible and have a number of failures. So we assume regulations are always going to be good and they aren't, as we knew in the case of Grenfell with approved document B. But also they can leave us with a false sense of security and stop looking for vulnerabilities. The second one is the, the myth of the perfect error-free world. Um, and I think that speaks for itself as humans make errors and our systems need to be resilient to errors and that the softer relational issues aren't that important. And finally, that you can create systemic change without shifting context. And I don't think we spend nearly enough effort in shifting context. Um, and then the opportunities to disrupt. So I think we need to increase our capability to deal with complexity and ambiguity. The world is changing and it's changing really fast. And when we get the, um, just in buildings, when we get kind of new materials, new responses, particularly to climate change, that complexity is only going to increase. And we're going to need the ability not just to follow rules, but to understand how to make things safe in complex and ambiguous environments. And then ensuring fairly born consequences, I think from a behavioral perspective, so the people that are paying the price of decades of um, unsafe buildings is leaseholders. And from a change perspective, that's not enabling change. So the people that caused it are not the people that are paying for it. And then from a relational perspective, tapping diverse and distributed knowledge, particularly the voice of the front line. And then creating safe space, spaces to challenge deeply held views in contextual so I don't believe we do enough to talk about what we really think, and we don't create safe spaces to engage in those kinds of conversations. And then to end with, um, it was really important to me, as much as I do often feel very um, angry and as if there isn't any hope, to honor the 72 people that died, I really wanted to end with hope and really hope for me is does lie in the democratization of change in organizations such as in our cladding scandal, you know, Grainful United, um, citizens that create change. And this is where I want to 
go back to what I said at the beginning is the more of us that are willing to be the agents of change, the seed so is the disruptive, the more chance we have of systemic change. And I will leave this quote up. I can't read it without crying, so I'm not going to read it out loud. But this is by Re Rebecca Solnit, who's written a lot about post-disaster communities. And her words really reflect my own experience of where I found hope, which is in particularly the community around Grenfell, in my case. And that is where I'm going to stop. I'll keep quiet while people read that. Well, that was fantastic, Joe. Um, I don't know how many people are actually listening in um, on, on their phones rather than seeing it on video, but if you want to, I could have read that quote out. Um, what do I mean to put it back up? Yeah, put it back up and I'll read it out, you know, just, just to get it, because some people might only be seeing it on the, on the, we go. On the phone. So uh, it's your final slide and it reads, Of hope, when all the ordinary divides and patterns are shattered, people step up to become their brothers and sisters keepers. And that purposefulness and correct connectedness bring joy even amidst death, chaos, fear and loss. We are building something immense together. The consequences of these transformations are perhaps more important where they are most subtle. They, re they remake the world and they do so mostly by the accretion of small gestures and statements and the embracing of new visions of what can be and should be. You can see changes to the ideas about whose rights matter and what is reasonable and who should decide if you sit still enough and gather the evidence of transformations that happen by a million tiny steps before they result in a landmark legal decision or an election of some other shift that puts us in a place we've never been. And that's by Rebecca Solnit. So I hope you don't mind, Jill. I read that out just to, for those people who are listening in. Oh, that's great. Thanks for doing that. That's okay. I, I don't know whether Ash is doing the uh, Q&A on this. I've not seen any come through, though. There's one in the chat about um, why the LFB told residents to stay put and not to evacuate. So the, I think the language that Sir Martin Moore Bick used in the phase one report that was that it stay put had become an article of faith so um, there was an assumption that compartmentation would work so the firefighting strategy in high-rise buildings I mean I know that from when I lived at Greenfield we had a fire there I live in Trelik we've had fires here um, but we know the pre the pre the refurbishment compartmentation worked in Grenfell. So there's a fire a couple of years before where compartmentation did work. And again, at Trelik, we know it does. Um, so staying put is thought to be safer because otherwise you've got multiple people trying to get down. In the case of Grenfell, it's a single, um, it's a single escape route. Trelik, we have two. Um, so the, the, and I don't think this is just the London Fire Brigade, but certainly most fire brigades, not all of them, um, but most fire brigades, it had become the, the wisdom of, of the day is compartmentation is going to work. So in a high rise building, your firefighter strategy is stay put and had become an article of faith. So that, you know, multiple people in command could not see we need to change this until Andy Rowe came along and went from my own perspective on that on the compartmentation i i only work in in new build residential and it's very rarely anything above three stories but the amount of work that goes into these uh new build properties on making sure that there's no um gaps between each compartment making sure doors fit perfectly well uh, any doors that go inside a garage that the usual regulations but there's so much work goes into uh, all the new build ones that I, that I see on on ensuring fire safety. Um, recently, uh, 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 there was a block that was four story, and they insisted on sprinklers uh, being fitted in that four story. Which I think, even at that level, it is it was a good thing to do, uh, and maybe that'll come in. Not sure where Wales are on all this. I think I think they're ahead of us on. Uh, ahead I think of Wales is ahead, yeah. And 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 to be honest, so there's a question: What has changed right now, physically and policy, to mitigate it? So there's a ban on all combustible materials in buildings over 18 meters, which is considered high rise, which is apparently arbitrary. So the question is being asked: Well, 
Do you know, is there, is there some kind of risk-based reason why 18 metres is considered the cutoff? And um, there, there is evidence, which I'm sure will come out in, in the next module of the inquiry, which is that's an arbitrary number. So arbitrarily, um, buildings over 18 metre have a ban on all combustible materials, which in my view could actually be an over um, reaction because now you've got issues where, where people can't sell their houses because they were built with wooden balconies or mm. so now they've got zero mortgage, uh, do, do you know, um, ratings, et cetera, et cetera. And from my perspective, people are not looking at risk holistically. So they're not considering, okay, it's got a wooden balcony, but there's two escape routes and there's sprinklers and there's, do you know, other, other things. So again, back to piecemeal and systemic is the response in my view is very piecemeal and reactionary and you just see unintended consequences when you when you operate that way and buildings under 18 meters you can still use flammable materials right ash have you got anything on the q and a's uh just one oh, there you go. Yeah. sorry ash we've lost you there Sorry, Ash, you sounded like you were coming live from Glastonbury then. Do you want to try again? Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just move room. Wait a second. I'll just, just take over because one of the questions, Jill, was from Ash. It said, um, what, was, what is the one thing uh, that you would change to make improvements syst systemically? I would do a holistic risk of all the buildings in the country. We're four and a half years later. Yeah. You know, I, I, I think I would, I would start with high rise because they're the most, you're more likely to die in a, in a high rise. So I would have done a holistic and I would prioritize um, remediation based on the risk of the building, not just the external facade. Um, right. Yeah. So, Simon, thank you for your comments. They were, they were great. Really appreciate that. And Ash, do you want to go through Stephen Cohen's? Thanks, Stephen, for your question. Um, Ash, do you want to go on, take that over? Yeah, thanks, Stuart. So um, what's changed right now physically to mitigate the policy, Jill? Uh, so, as I said, the banning of combustible materials in buildings over 18 metres. And then Wait, and why why do you think we've still got so many multiple failings across industry? What's that one kind of key thing that you think's affecting that? So I think so if I, if you look at the model, I, I think that there's a failure to think from a catastrophic risk perspective. So I don't think people have been or could have been thinking about it for multiple decades is what could be a catastrophic failure and people haven't searched for vulnerabilities so you end up with a race to the bottom culture and you end up with people you know immorally um feeling knowingly flammable so I, I do think there's regulatory failures and, 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 and absolutely but there's also an industry that didn't didn't operate according to high quality so and that if you look at the amount of failures is decades old okay now, you. last question uh, let last me just question. say let me just say let me say one other thing to that is there's a there's a brilliant um talk by jose torero who's one of the inquiry um expert witnesses where he talks about what he believes the failure is one of competence so that, that so we fail to keep up our levels of competence with an increasingly complex world. So we're getting new building materials all the time. Um, do you know we're getting much more complexity into buildings, and we haven't raised competence to keep up with that level of ambiguity and complexity. So I think that's great, clear as well. That's great. Jill. A question from Nina. Um, from what perspective of fire risk assessors, what would you see as being their main role in aiding change positively? So from a fire risk assessor perspective. Not a fire risk assessor, but I would say anybody who has any accountability 
to do with fire or building safety is speak up when you know it's not right because there's still a lot going on. I get sent messages every week about, I saw this, I saw that, I saw the next thing. So speak up and raise hell. Don't be silenced. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I'm combining a couple of questions from Sarah and Paul. Um, distinct lack of foreseeability within the industry and local government. Um, how do we think that those on the ground need to feel confident about going against that stay put order? I just, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question. Just say it again. Of course. So from a lack of foreseeability with the industry um, and within local government guidance, what do you think needs to happen to enable those on the ground to feel confident in going against a stay put order from the fire service? So in my experience, I think the public's behavior has changed. I, you know, whatever, whatever the fire brigade or government or whatever's done, if you see fires now, you tend to see people evacuating and you tend also to see the public alerting people to um so and again if you if you look at the model for systemic change i think there's been a contextual shift in the public around stay put so people are doing what they think they need to do to keep themselves safe which is mostly get out um and then and then you get kind of like the fire service which thinks that's not a good idea in some cases but i don't think it matters i think public are gonna do what the public are gonna do <laughs> Brilliant. That's great. Thanks. That's it. At the end of the question is back to yourself, Stuart. Oh, thank you. Um, some of the things that I, I've been reading recently, and I hope you don't mind uh, me sharing these, but it, it kind of ties in with this presentation. One was Matthew Syed's Rebel Ideas that says, don't just have people nodding their heads and saying yes to everything in your boardrooms. You need disruptors. You need your pirates in your boardroom. Those are at the thick of it. And, and to be listened to. So, you know, We've got to get those rebels in there if we want to get systemic change, because at the moment, the, the people who are making the decisions are all um, similar to the, I think I think it's the CIA, who all dress in white with a black tie. So uh, that was the analogy that Simon, uh, Matthew Syed used. But the other thing that was really interesting is um, Daniel Kahneman's recent book on noise, which is all about judgments. And it's only when you start combining reading matter like this that, that these decisions of systemic change start to make sense. Because what, what they've brought in, what, what Daniel Kahneman and his two uh, co-authors have talked about is how our judgments um, are, are affected by not just bias, but noise, um, the amount of decisions that we have to make. Um, so really interesting how those tie in nicely with Jill and I would highly recommend tagging them on to, to Jill's book and reading them also but really appreciate you speaking today Jill um, re really great to see you and I know you've got lots of places to be over the next few weeks um, if anybody's interested tomorrow night there's um, uh, a TV documentary about um, could could you just do Greenfall. so it's called Greenfall the Untold Story it's on channel four so it's um now, I haven't seen the full thing. I've, I've seen so, some of it, but it's essentially some videos and stuff that were taken before the fire about the residents' attempts to stop things or intervene with the council. So I, I, know, I know the producer and I know people that are involved in it who really trust her. So I'm looking forward to seeing that. And just, Stuart, to pick up on your point is... I do believe this whole diversity of thinking is absolutely critical and speaking up and listening to people you don't agree with and inviting challenging voices and in, more than inviting is ensuring you have challenging voices in decisions um, and in buildings that's often residents actually listening to what they have to say. And even if they're angry, that's probably just because they haven't been heard for decades so, you know, go, go through whatever that anger is and actually hear what's behind the emotion. Absolutely. Absolutely.
Uh, I hope you all enjoyed that presentation. Um, it, it was brilliant. Really, really enjoyed that. And thank you for joining us here at uh, IOS Manchester in Northwest District from wherever you are in the world, because we do have uh, people dialing in internationally and it, we really welcome them. Um, happy to have them along. Um, Helen, is there anything I need to finish off with now before we close the presentation? Um, just that um, we will be sending out a feedback um, link, so keep an, e an eye out for an email with that, and um, if you could please fill it in, that'd be really good. Okay. Wonderful. <laughs> Fabulous, and we've just had a, somebody dialing in from Palestine, so I hope you're safe and well, and um, thank you for dialing in and, and looking at our little area of the world. Wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye, everybody.